最前沿的科学研究。Hello, welcome to the first episode of Science Rehashed, a podcast where we sit down with lead authors and dive into their ideas and discoveries in science. I'm Shen Ning, and I'm Mehdi Jorfi, and we are your hosts. We're very fortunate today to have Dr. Sai as our guest on Science Rehashed. Dr. Sai is the director of the Pakawar Institute for Learning and Memory. She is a professor of neuroscience at the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences. And a senior associate member of the Broad Institute, she recently co-founded the Aging Brain Initiative and is the co-director of the Lana Down Syndrome Center at MIT. Her work has been recognized by a number of prestigious awards. We're very excited to begin our podcast series discussing the latest work from Professor Sai's group. Three years back in 2016, her team published a paper that completely shook the field. When they reported that stimulation at 40 hertz using flickering LED light could help clear amyloid in the visual cortex, one of the key hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease, the authors called this technique Genus, short for gamma entrainment using sensory stimulus. Impressive, absolutely. However, the visual cortex is hardly involved in the cognitive decline in Alzheimer's disease. Which made the scientific community highly skeptical regarding the clinical relevance of genus. So that was a couple of years ago. So what are they up to now, Medi? Well, there is a lot on the table. A few months ago, Sai fought back with new evidence. The study published in the journal Cell showed that presenting sound clicks at 40 times per second clears out toxic protein buildup in the auditory cortex and hippocampus. The treatment also activated the brain's scavenging immune cells, microglia, into action, allowing them to more efficiently clear out amyloid debris. In another paper, which just published in the journal Neuron, they further demonstrated that chronic exposure to the flickering light for several weeks reduces amyloid and tau and protects neurons from dying. What's more, combining lights with sound therapy further boosted the effect, which helps to spread the protective results throughout the brain, including the cortex. It's a very provocative idea. It's non-invasive, easy, and potentially low cost. With that, welcome to Science Rehashed, Dr. Sai. Tell us a little bit about your journey in research and how you ended up here at MIT. So I was born and raised in Taiwan, and trained to be a vet. But sort of, I changed my mind, and I had a second thought about whether I, you know, I really wanted to be a vet for the rest of my life. So, so I decided to give myself an opportunity to do research. I got into a master's program at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and for the first time in my life, I had a chance to work in the laboratory and taking classes, learning modern molecular biology and cell biology, and I realized that I was really in love with scientific research. So,、mm -hmm. so I subsequently applied for a PhD. I became a graduate student in the、uh, microbiology program. At the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. Then subsequently, I received postdoctoral training at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory and at Mass General Hospital. It was during my postdoctoral training I began a collaboration with a child neurologist. Dr. Vern Cavanas at the Mass General,、mm -hmm. and he really introduced me. To the realm of、uh, neurobiology. At the time, I was really fascinated by it, so I decided to sort of train myself, learn、uh, neuroscience. And when I was on the job market to become an independent principal investigator, I told everyone that I wanted to switch my field to work on neurobiology,、mm -hmm. and it was. 
almost 30 years ago. Mm-hmm. Now when I think wow. about it, the, I was surprised that I actually received uh, multiple offers despite the fact that I totally had no experience at the time. I, I wasn't trained any, you know, neurobiology labs, but was very happy. I took a job at Harvard Medical School mm-hmm. in the Department of Pathology, right. and I started my own neuroscience research program, mm-hmm. and really everything started from there. And how you got into Alzheimer's research? Yeah, so initially I studied um, brain development. I studied a molecule called cyclin-dependent kinase 5, mm-hmm. which is very important for the formation of the different layers mm-hmm. of neurons. And when uh, we created the so-called knockout mice, mm-hmm. this mice developed highly abnormal brain cell architecture, um, also other behavior abnormalities. I would say about three, four years into the research program, really by serendipity, a graduate student in the lab realized that there's another form, setting up in kinase 5, Uh, isoform Mm -hmm. that actually can be very toxic to neurons. And so we became very interested in that. Then later on realized that this form can be identified in Alzheimer's disease mouse model and also in post-mortem human brains. Mm -hmm. So how did you switch from the molecular side to the 40 hertz uh, oscillation? Oh, that is a long, long story. (laughs) So, So we started to work on Alzheimer's disease initially really very much on the molecular level, cellular level. And very quickly, I realized that that's not enough. Right. For, mm-hmm. us to, for us to understand the disease. Yeah. And we really need to look at the picture at the more sort of systems level, mm-hmm. whole organisms level. So I realized that I would love to be surrounded by colleagues who carry out neuroscience research at that level. And around that time, MIT, Picard Institute, they were trying to identify a senior scientist who works on you know, neurodegenerative disease. So they reached out to me turned out to be a perfect match. Yeah. So I uh, relocated from Harvard Medical School to MIT in 2006. Okay. Yeah, so from there, you know, you know, the type of questions that I ask are sort of, at least from my point of view, sort of very, very different. And I quickly established new collaborations. Right. And at the time, I started to collaborate with a professor named Christopher Moore. And at the time... Uh-huh. Optogenetics right. was just reported, mm-hmm. and uh, everybody was so super excited about that. And so Chris and I decided to quickly adopt that technology into the lab and then ask if we use that method to drive or to activate a particular type of interneurons mm-hmm. known as the path albumin positive fast spiking interneurons, mm-hmm. what will happen, right? right? So really this started the whole 40 hertz. That was the beginning. So we uh, received the, the virus that we can transduce chenerodopsin into this particular type of interneurons, PV interneurons. So for the listeners who don't know what chenerodopsin does, can you tell us a little bit more about that? And how optogenetics so, works. Yeah, so optogenetics really transformed our neuroscience research because you can use this opsin, which is normally expressed by algae, mm-hmm. you know, not in mammalian cells right. at all. You can artificially introduce this opsin okay. into any type of cell, neurons in particular, you then can use light to activate this opsin. Uh-huh. So then you can introduce activity right. into a particular type of neurons. Right. Before that, it was not possible to right. specifically target a particular type of neurons. Right. So because of that technology, we were able to do that. We took advantage of that. To mm-hmm. so um, shine the light and the Shine the light and you can produce millisecond response from the neurons. Okay. So we decided to activate this fast spiking interneurons uh-huh. in the uh, somatosensory cortex uh-huh. of the mice. Okay. Very interestingly, we found that when we introduce this laser light to these neurons, this group of neurons respond in a very specific fashion. They tend to fire at a frequency sort of peak around 40 
to 50 hertz. And then we were like, what's going on? Uh-huh. Is that just the property of any neuron? So we actually also engineered the channel adoption into the regular sort of excitatory neurons. Uh-huh. And then we test when we activate these neurons, how do they behave? And it turned out that those excitatory neurons, when we activate them, they can only fire at a much lower frequency uh-huh. range, like around 8 to 10 hertz. Okay. But this PV neuron, they can fire around 40 to 50 hertz. So okay. this is very famous squarely in the so-called gamma oscillation range. Okay. So gamma oscillations have been observed in animals and human mm-hmm. subjects, particularly when they are actively engaged mm-hmm. in some tasks, like working memory or, you know, in humans, like you're solving a problem, solving okay. a puzzles. So um, is it attention specific? Attention, yes. Okay can lead to, you know, increased gamma oscillation power in animals and in humans. Mm -hmm. So in the back of our mind, we're always very interested about really what does gamma oscillation do. Yeah, exactly. So afterwards, the paper was published. In the meantime, my lab had become more and more involved with Alzheimer's research, okay? Okay. Sort of less and less brain development and more and more Alzheimer's. And today, I can tell you, that's all my lab does. So along the way, a graduate student joined the lab. I think that uh, that was like 2012. She found that there are a few some papers out there showing that in Alzheimer's disease models, the power of gamma oscillation is reduced. That gave us this first idea of what will happen if we use optogenetics to induce gamma oscillations Mm -hmm. in these mouse models, Mm -hmm. okay? Our first experiment was to use optogenetics to target those fast-biking interneurons and then particularly induce the neurons to to fire at 40 hertz Mm -hmm. in the hippocampus and and see what happens. Right. Right. So what exactly do you observe when you stimulate the Alzheimer's mice with the 40 hertz? (laughs) Yeah. So, you know, at the time we really didn't know what we could look for because at that young age, They don't have any cognitive behavior sometimes, right? right? So literally, there was nothing known Mm -hmm. about gamma oscillations and, say, cellular effect. So I have to say, I gave my graduate student, Hannah, a tons of credit. She decided to just look at amyloid peptide levels in the hippocampal lysates. Mm -hmm. So, So what she did was to drive this activation of this fast-biking interneurons Mm -hmm. at 40 hertz in the hippocampus for one hour. She then took the hippocampus out from this mice, made lysates, and then measured amyloid peptide levels quantitatively and showed me her first results. And there we saw like this um, very drastic reduction Mm -hmm. of amyloid peptide levels. Hannah repeated many times. So then I I remember I presented to my other colleagues. One of my colleagues, Emery Brown, Mm -hmm. and and he said, he's like, this really has translational potential, but after genetics, it's very invasive. So as you know, you have to perform surgery and introduce virus and and implant the fiber optics and, and so on. So he said, do you think you can think of a non-invasive way to increase gamma power mm-hmm. in the brain? So I said, oh, right. <laughs> so he said, don't, don't worry, don't worry. Discuss this, and then we can also look through the literature and see whether this has been done previously. And of course, it was done previously. Okay. So this is a German physiologist, Wolf Singer. Mm. He published a, I would say, very influential paper where he shined the light mm-hmm. to cat. Mm. So then, obviously, the next question is, what about the sensory stimulation-induced gamma, whether it's the same as optogenetically induced gamma, right. especially in terms of the reduction of amyloid? Mm-hmm. And it turned out that that's totally consistent. We also saw a drastic reduction of amyloid yeah. in this uh, young Alzheimer's model. Okay. So also in, in the paper, you show that microglia is affected by the 40 hertz stimulation. So how does gamma stimulation, but not other neuronal firing patterns, regulate microglial biology and induce uh, yeah, amyloid that, clearance? Yeah, that is a great, great, great question. We don't have an answer right. yet, okay. but I think that is something very important to figure out. 
after we identify the amyloid reduction property, why is amyloid reduced by gamma, right? Right. right. What Hannah identified was that the production of amyloid by neurons seems to be somewhat reduced. Mm-hmm. Right. Unexpected really was a, a robust response from microglia. Mm-hmm. What she found was that this microglia look morphologically, you know, look different, mm-hmm. and they also show uh, more colocalization with amyloid in their cell body, meaning they become more active in engulfing amyloid. Mm-hmm. There are probably multiple mechanisms mediating uh, amyloid reduction. Okay. The key question is how microglia can sense gamma oscillations right. and respond to it. One can think of is it many activated? different possibilities. Right. Whether it's a direct response, you right. know, microglia respond to this neural oscillatory activity sure. somehow by electrical signal, which I don't know how possible that is. Or when some neurons engage in this uh, 40 hertz oscillation, they then can release certain factor mm-hmm. or a neurotransmitter that microglia can sense and respond to it. Mm-hmm. So I think those are the hypotheses that we are testing right so now. So for the non-scientific audience, the microglia are the first responder immune cells in the brain to the pathogens, true. right? Very true. These microglia are the resident immune cells mm-hmm. in the brain. After you have the stimulation with the 40 hertz and you say there's an activation of the microglia cells, does it persist over time or is it kind of temporary? We think that it all depends. Okay. It can persist, but there is a time limit. Uh-huh. So in the 2016 paper, when we first reported about the sensory-induced gamma and its effects on reducing mm-hmm. Alzheimer's pathology, we show that if we in the young mice, mm-hmm. if we do this one hour stimulation, we can see this um, reduced amyloid up to 12 hours. Mm-hmm. But then after that, the level goes back up. I so I think probably the effect lasts for several hours, uh-huh. but then mm-hmm. without continuous stimulation, mm-hmm. everything going to go back. Right. So you mentioned that you combine the auditory stimulation with the visual. So do you see a combined effect that's different from the independent effects? We definitely, you know, saw that it seems that the best effect can be achieved through the combined mm-hmm. visual and auditory. Because with um, each single modality stimulation, mm-hmm. we usually have to stimulate for weeks oh. in the older mice. Like when the mice start to develop this aggregated amyloid plaques or profound tau pathology, right. in those older mice or more advanced mice, uh-huh. we do need to stimulate for several weeks to see a clear reduction of the plaque pathology. Okay. What Even if- just one week, one hour per day for a week, you can see some effect in the, say, visual cortex. But to see the effect in other parts of the brain, we do need to go much longer. Initially, when we found that this stimulation can induce oscillation in the sensory cortex, mm-hmm. right? But we then realized that this effect actually can propagate to other parts of the brain, which is really, really fascinating. fascinating. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But what we found is that with combined modality, that propagation of this protective effect seems to be even profound, and, and we can shorten the duration to see an effect. I see. So does that make a difference when you stimulate, whether at an earlier stage of the disease or a later stage of the disease? I think that in general, especially... For neurodegeneration, it's always better to go in an earlier stage because neurodegeneration meaning there's degeneration of the brain. So if you go to a more advanced stage, a lot of cells are already lost. Mm -hmm. A lot of structures are lost. Mm -hmm. So to recover from that, really no one really knows whether that can be done. But in a much earlier stage, you go in before a lot of the damages have been done. I think it's always, you know, you have a better chance. Absolutely. Of seeing, yeah, yeah, yeah. And but effect. can you still see a robust effect of amyloid reduction even though it's earlier, a later stage of the disease? 
Yeah, earlier stage, like at least in the transgenic mouse model, in the very young mice, before they develop precipitation of plaques, but they already show increased amyloid levels. Mm -hmm. So those are soluble amyloid beta peptides, and that's why we can see even just after one hour stimulation, Mm -hmm. we can see the change in the soluble amyloid peptides. So can you comment about what the difference between soluble and insoluble peptides? So so insoluble, they are fibrillar, they are aggregated, probably, you know, there's sort of different mechanisms in terms of clearing of the soluble versus insoluble amyloid. And which ones work toxic? That is up to debate, right? I mean, there are a lot of people saying the soluble, you know, oligomeric A-beta is the toxic species. Right. So this is a fascinating methodology and technology. Can it be applied to other neurological diseases? You know, since we actually see a very impressive neuroprotective effect, Mm -hmm. at least in mouse models, Mm -hmm. I think there are a number of you know, diseases involved in loss of neurons and loss mm-hmm. of synapses. So I think at least it will be worthwhile to test some of these other indications. What is the effect of the 40 hertz on tau pathology? So we have the tau transgenic mouse model mm-hmm. overexpressing a, a human tau mm-hmm. with a mutation that causes frontotemporal dementia. Mm-hmm. So this transgenic model show a massive amount of hyperphosphorylation mm-hmm. of tau mm-hmm. and then uh, develop tangle-like pathology. And they also show a good amount of neuronal loss. Okay. We started the uh, stimulation of the mice right before the onset of neuronal loss. Okay. What we found is that there's a huge reduction mm-hmm. of hyperphosphorylation of tau mm-hmm. on multiple phosphoapitopes and reduction of this kind of like or this very aggregated form of tau staining pattern. All over the brain or just in All certain- over the brain. Okay. And also there is a rescue of cell loss. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's quite fascinating. Right. And, and tau is really important for Alzheimer's disease because it's the second key hallmark of the Alzheimer's pathology. But using um, this particular mouse model for frontal temporal dementia, though, because um, the one that you're using for amyloid is different, right? It's, it can't recapitulate tau. No, so none of the amyloid mouse models show um, tau developed tau pathology. Right. Okay. Yeah. So th- there is no doubt that this is a mind-blowing technique to approach, actually, Alzheimer's disease. But from other angle, what are the major limitations of the technique? In terms of major limitations, of course, we have no idea whether this is going to work in people. So far, all the drugs that fail in humans, they yeah. all work in mice mm-hmm. uh, and cure Alzheimer's right. in mice. So uh, whether our approach is going to work in humans, I have no idea. But I do feel that since this is non-invasive, mm-hmm. this seems to be very safe, mm-hmm. definitely worthwhile yeah, uh, testing yeah, right. worth a try, uh, absolutely. In, in human subjects. Yeah. But then, you know, the limitation, I would say, is that Say right now in animals, we do one hour per day stimulation. Mm -hmm. We don't know whether one hour is the best dose, whether two hours will be better than one hour. Mm -hmm. In the sense of pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, we really have no idea. So in humans, what would be the best optimal duration of treatment? We we don't know. Once, I mean, you start the stimulation, you're probably going to just have to do it for the rest of your life. Right. Um, right. So it's long-term. And cr- yeah, it's going to be yeah long-term. It's like you're taking a um, cholesterol drug. You right. cannot stop it. Right. Right. Yeah, but it only take a few seconds to take a pill. While with this, you're going to have to probably spend at least 30 minutes or an hour a day right. uh, to, to receive the stimulation. And you founded Cognito Therapeutics, right? Um, and that's intended to use this technique to help cognitively impaired 
people. Yeah. So could you tell us more about what you guys are doing there? So Carnito is really going to optimizing sort of the stimulation condition mm-hmm. to apply to human subjects. So they have come up with a particular device mm-hmm. they are using mm-hmm. in human subjects, which is a wearable device. Mm-hmm. And they're right now doing clinical studies. I mean, in a small population of people, mm-hmm. including people with cognitive impairment mm-hmm. and people with Alzheimer's disease. Mm-hmm. So they are you know, collecting data right now, and their goal is to conduct a much larger trial, probably starting by the end of the year. Oh, that's exciting. Wow, fascinating. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Sai, for joining oh, us today. We really enjoyed learning about your 40 hertz idea and hope that this holds promise for the future of Alzheimer's therapeutics. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I can't wait to hear about your upcoming results. Thank you for listening to Science Rehashed. If you love the podcast, please subscribe and give a review on iTunes. And don't forget to tune in for our next episode. Until next time.